Dave Kaba is an entrepreneur. He's a managed service provider, an MSP or technology service provider, TSP. I've known Dave for a long time. Uh, I had an MSP as well. We talk about uh, lots of advice that MSP should have and vendors that work with MSPs. Uh, what should they do? It's a very good. Um, I really enjoy talking to Dave. Known him for a long time. We talk about the do's and don'ts. He has a firm now that helps MSPs with peer groups and with uh, executive search. Uh, but just a fascinating man. He he has a spiritual background where he actually went to school. Uh, I don't want to give too much away, but uh, very fascinating man. I've known him for a long time. He's had some tragedy in his life as well, but really, really smart, really, really inspiring man. I really enjoy talking with him, and I know you'll enjoy this conversation too. Dave Kaba, uh, former MSP, works with MSPs, has great advice for managed service providers and for vendors that want to work with MSPs. I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. I certainly did. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Joey Pins. People ask me, how did I lose 130 pounds? The quick answer is always discipline. I started my business, wasn't paying attention to my health, was eating too much, you know, drinking too much sweets. My daughter was born. Next thing I know, I'm pre-diabetic, I have hypertension. I knew something had to change. Discipline. I, like many of you, have faced many challenges in your career, in your family, in your life, in your faith. How did you attack them? How did you approach them? How did you solve them, hopefully? It all had to have some degree of discipline. I'm also asked, how did you found and start a tech business that lasted over 25 years? Discipline. I was committed to it, enjoyed technology, didn't enjoy some aspects of it, but knew it was necessary. Discipline. Our podcast mission, how do we use discipline to better ourselves and society? Join me, please, as I talk to interesting people and discuss how they use discipline in their family and their passion and their careers and how it helped them. Our podcast vision, growth through learning from others. Joey Pins Discipline Conversations. It will be light and serious. Join us, please. Thank you for consideration. Appreciate you doing this, Dave. Known you for a long time. I really appreciate your time today. It is my pleasure. I've been looking forward to it. The more I looked at what you're doing, the more excited I was to do this. So. Is that right? Well, thank you. So is it a good time to be an MSP, a managed service provider right now? It is a terrific time to be an MSP. It's uh, the, the people ask me, do you, do you miss having an MSP? Do you miss having a business? Hmm. And I, and I just say, and there's all kinds of things I don't miss about it, but it's like it's like seeing the stock market shoot through the roof and knowing that you don't have money in it. I mean, it, <laughs> it is a terrific time to be an MSP um, if if you're reasonably mature and, and good at what you're doing. I mean, like we coach them and work with them in our peer groups, and we're seeing companies growing 20, 30, 50 percent year over year right now through the pandemic. It's a terrific time for a recurring revenue business that uh, that is a necessity and not a luxury. The only people that are really hurting are the ones that are focused on, you know, theaters and hotels and things like that. Right. Yeah, yeah that are directly affected, of course, of course. Yeah, and there's really they've got to they've got to diversify. Unfortunately, is the term MSP or the acronym MSP is that an accurate one for our industry? You know. I know a lot of people have started to uh, get away from it. And I think some of that is due to, uh, you know, a, a little bit of a whiff of stigma, you mm -hmm. know, with some of the bre recent breaches and things. And some people are starting, starting to go to TSP, technology service provider. I have, I have no problem with the term MSP. I, I have more of a problem with companies that call themselves MSPs that in, <laughs> in reality, are, uh, are 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 not really doing what an MSP uh, ought to be doing, you know. Kind of the one man, one or two man shops that think they have a business, but in reality, what they have is a, a job, you know. And and they are it's a company with an employee, and the employee is them, you know. And, uh, and they're not really providing proactive service, so I don't have an issue with it. And it is getting turned around. I hear ITSP, right? I hear 
technology service provider. We see ConnectWise using TSP a lot, actually. ConnectWise is one of our main vendors and partners uh, for many it's MSPs. It's just so broad and almost takes the meaning out of it. Everything's a technology service provider. Sometimes I think that companies like ConnectWise do that because they want to broaden their right. sales base past MSPs and, you know, TSP is it's just so general, you know. Absolutely is. Now you're in New York. You started where we first met. You started Proactive Technologies back in 07, I believe. Yes, sir. And you were there and you kept that going until 19, till 2019? Yep. I, I thought about this, this being a podcast on, on discipline. And with your permission, I'd like to go back a little further and tell Please. you a quick story of how I got into technology very good, and not, not into MSP world. The, uh, so in my twenties, my, my, every time somebody asked me where I went to school, it's a giant can of worms, you know, cause I'm like, okay, here we go. This is going to be an interesting conversation because yes. my schooling was for ministry. Right. I have a bachelor's in pastoral studies and a master's in educational ministries with a an advanced certificate in biblical studies, English language, which is basically like a minor on the master's level. Um, so when they asked me that, they go, what? You know, and I'm like, yeah, that's that's how I started my career. And I quickly figured out that's not what I wanted to do. That wasn't for me. And, you know, at the age of 26 or 27, I was going, well, what do I want to do with my life? You know, what, what, you know, I, I try and take a positive spin on it and say, you know, I, uh, I, well, I guess I can choose a career because, you know, the, these degrees aren't going to help me with mu much else. So I, uh, I like computers and I was pretty good with them and had always tinkered with my own. And, uh, no, Dave, I'm sorry. Is this the nineties? This would be the late nineties. Yeah. Okay. Late nineties. Okay. I, um, I said, I, I think I'm going to try and get into computers and, the church had been good to me, pay me, pay me for the summer while I was, you know, had minimal responsibilities. They knew I was transitioning out. And it turned out that this would have been the summer of 99, 99, 98. Um, and uh, something big is about had, to happen. We, we just had a baby, uh. right? And my wife wasn't working. We had $2,000 in the bank. Our rent was $1,200 a month. Mm. And I took a job working night shift security at the U.S. Open. 15 straight nights. six fifty an hour. Trying to get past those 40 hours where you got that time and a half and got to 975. Nice. Right? And I st all night, I stood there with an A-plus book this thick, you know, studying, 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 trying to get my A-plus certification, smoking cheap cigars. On a, on a next to a tennis court in Queens, right? And and uh, and I that that those fifteen days changed my life. Hmm. You know, I I figured I'm a smart guy who works hard and I'll be fine. And while I was there, I saw I saw people who had three other jobs that were just trying to squirrel away a little extra money because they wanted their kid to be the first one to go to college. Hmm. I hmm. saw people that couldn't hold down the job for the whole fifteen days because all they did was party. You know, and I saw everything in between. And I never I never looked at people that, uh, you know, waiters and waitresses and janitors and people that just work, grind out these jobs every day. I never looked at them out, uh, the same again, you know. Uh, and it changed me. I, I Anyway, I wound up getting that A-plus certification. I couldn't find a job in technology. You know, my, now, anybody listening, Dave, A-plus certification is what? It's basically a really entry level um, computer certification. Right. It teaches you how to about all the basics of computers, not even really networks very much. Installing so. RAM, yeah, setting yeah. up works. And yeah. at this point, it's they've updated it some, so it gives you a, a little. Uh, you know, it's not it's not like it's completely useless uh, at all. But back then, it was a lot of command line stuff and. Mm. And how to operate in DOS and load the operating system and IRQs and all this, you know, the, uh, all that weird stuff. So, yeah, so all that study had paid off. I, I couldn't find a job. I'd been offered an assistant manager job at a, at a pharmacy because I had experience with vitamins and herbs. 
my wife said, don't take it. You want that job in technology, you'll be miserable. And, uh, and I wound up getting a job at, at dot com uh, as an intern. They asked me, my interview went like this. They said, do you know how to use a screwdriver? I said, yes. They said, do you think you put those racks together? And I said, absolutely. And I'll, I'll figure it out. And in nine months, I was I was managing the help desk. Hmm. Um, so that's, that's, that's the roots, you know, that starting a, starting a business came much later. Um, the, the, you know, it, talking in terms of discipline saying, I'm going to set my mind to something, you know, and I'm going to work hard at it and try and get it. And at some point it, I needed someone else to come alongside me and, and encourage me, which most of us do need. And we all have the opportunity to do that for other people. And then it was off and running from there but you know i was not born with a silver spoon you know and mm. most of us weren't so were you always disciplined as a child I mean, where did you get this this i mean by the way who won the u.s open that year do you know <laughs> the, uh, I, Sampras? I, I did i did get to go uh, this is now our far field but i did get to go to the first agassiz sampras final ah. my uncle gave me tickets to a uh a suite that his work had given him on the condition that I would take his babysitter on a blind date. Nice. It was a disastrous date, but a great tennis match. So, hmm. and uh, if we take a step back, you went to school for ministry. So you in high school, did you have a spiritual calling? Where did you, where did you get that from? Huh? Well, um, I had grown up in church and stuff and kind of walked away from it. And, uh, you know, a lot had my parents split when I was young and my, my teenage years was a lot of, uh, shall we say, spiritual wandering, kind of feeling like kind of feeling like uh, I really want to I really wanted to be a good Christian, you know, and I'd, hmm. I'd try for a few days or a week and I'd just be like, ah, I, I can't do this. I'm no it's good at hard. this. Yeah. You know, like I, I can't I'm as much as I try and be like the perfect ones and I, 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 I'm no good at it. I'm not hmm. I'm just not like them. And I don't want to be like the hypocrites. I can't stand those people. So I just mm. gave up after a while. And uh, at some point I did have an awakening. You know, it was, it was right after I graduated high school. And, uh, you know, long story short, I just, I told God, you know, I just said, I, I, uh, I think I figured out that you just love me. And it's not based on whether I'm good or bad or, or performing well or not performing well. And I'm kind of a knucklehead. But if you want me, you can have me. And that's that started a whole nother road for me that, you know, not on career wise, but I'm still on today. So very interesting. And discipline, you didn't consider yourself this well disciplined growing up. I, I in some ways I was I was always mm -hmm. an athlete, played soccer for 13 years, um, completely undisciplined when it came to school. Mm -hmm. I was the guy whose SATs were through the roof and his grades were in the toilet, mm -hmm. you know. Cause I didn't care, you know, and, uh, I didn't care about anything I was studying and until I got into college and was learning the Bible and learning ministry stuff. And all of a sudden I was acing everything cause I was interested in it. Mm. You know, I cared. So, um, I, I learned to have discipline. I never, I never studied till I went to college, you know, and mm. then I would, I would pages and pages of notes and acronyms and, and, you know, for a while, I carried a 4 -0. yeah. Wow. So you're at this dot .com. You work from building the racks to head a help desk. Yep. And then? Uh, that dot .com had the, had the uh, uh, incredible honor of being the worst performing stock of, uh, I believe it was 1999, where IPO'd at $15, went down to $0.50. Cents. The, uh, you know, the uh, stock options I was basing my retirement on didn't didn't work out too well. <sighs> and uh, and so I bounced around to a couple other dot coms. I followed my boss uh, to another one. And uh, and eventually I wound up at a consulting company that was right next to the American Stock Exchange, right by Ground Zero. It was literally. Um, with an eye shot of Ground Zero shortly after 9/11, uh, so I went there in 2002, um, and uh, I 
had never worked for a consulting company before, you know, and they said, you know, Dave, we've got this little, little, uh, they called it, they called it VMIS, virtual MIS, you know, where they did network support for small businesses. And basically what had happened was it really wasn't their cup of tea. It wasn't what they did. They did infrastructure work. They did relocation services. They did cable designs for mid-sized financial companies and, and but when 9-11 hit, all that work dried up. No one was doing any big projects in New York City. Mm. And people mm. had been saying to them for a long time, you know, do you do the networks too? And they were like, no, no, no. And after a while, they were just like, sure, we do, you know, and mm. but they didn't know what they were doing. So they said, you know, we've got these four clients. We think they're all ready to fire us. We, we've got these two employees and we think you're the right guy to manage this group and maybe turn it around. And uh, so I said, well, what do you need me to do? And they said, oh, just take care of them. When then something goes wrong, you fix it. And after a month or so, I was like, you know, I think if this doesn't start making money, they're just going to fire us all. You know, like it, no one explained the business side, side of it That's to me. I was just like, oh, take care of clients, fix computers. I can do that. You know, and I was like, you know, <laughs> there's three of us employees and four clients. If we don't grow this thing and start making them money, they're just going to shut it down. Hmm. So uh, I was there four and a half years. We grew that practice to about uh, 30 clients. It wound up, by the time I left, it was more than half the company's um, revenue. And uh, the company was pretty dysfunctional. It wasn't doing well at, at the time. There was some drama. And I just said, I, I got to get out of here. And I really didn't want to start a business. I am I am the dead opposite of your traditional entrepreneur in terms of I'm not the the at least and I, I think I've changed over the years, but I was not like the born visionary, you know, chasing dreams and stuff. It was like, OK, my dad always told me to start a business someday. Both of my grandfathers, my you know, my one grandfather owned a liquor store for 20 years. The other one had a, you know, just like I'm sitting here selling records on the side. He he had a, a farm and he sold birds and chickens and rabbits on the side. And I grew up watching him doing that, making deals in his backyard mm. and stuff. Just, they were hustlers, you know? So when the time came, I said, you know, we've got all these clients, like we've, we've, but this is a, we can't work for this company anymore. I think it's just time for me to start a business. And I was, I wasn't excited about it. I was terrified. Um, for me, it was a very much, you know, a lot of people make the decision with their heart and not their head. It mm. was totally the other way around. It was, it was all head and, and no heart. And I, I came to love being an entrepreneur, but but uh, but it wasn't there from the from the beginning. It's shocking for me to hear that because that's how I always I, that's how I always envision you. Still do as an entrepreneur. Well, thank you, and I think I've turned into that. But but when you look at the those guys that were just born to do it and were always going to run something and, and, uh, and, and create something, you know, I always felt like if I worked for somebody that was really good at what they did, who I really respected, I would, I would be completely happy in that number two, two slot for my whole life. You know? Hmm. So, Interesting. And this is mid two thousands at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So like you said, we started the business in 2007 and terrible time a, to start a business. It was a, well, yes and no. I mean, they say the best businesses are built during recessions. Yes. Right? I mean, like no one's you're 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 learning how to run lean, right? So, um, we exploded when we started the business. We did 1.4 million dollars in revenue our first eight months. Wow. You know, we had we had my partner and I had taken out. Uh, home equity line of credits, you know, like we were, we used, we borrowed against our houses to start the business. Uh, we put in $50,000 a piece. Mine was half from a, uh, a line of, line of credit on my house and half from a settlement settlement from an accident. My wife was in, you know, we just saw it as no plan B. We succeed or lose our houses is, is how we looked at it. Wow. And, uh, that it exploded and, uh, all the good intentions of, systematizing things and 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 uh, and really developing good processes went out the window immediately because we were just crushed with work hmm. and uh and we were off and, and running but that 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 uh that first year was really crazy my partner and i both had 
major, major medical issues. I'm sure that mine was, you know, in part due to, to stress, you know, I wound up having uh, two thirds of my right lung removed uh, less than a year after we started that business. Wow. Um, I had a tumor in my bronchial tube. So yeah, nothing, nothing's been easy. It's, uh, but it has been an adventure. And you're in the heart of Manhattan working at the financial district with the financial companies at this point. Yeah. So, um, basically working primarily with hedge funds and private equity firms, the overwhelming majority of them were kind of in this rectangle between 40th and 60th street, 60th street between third and sixth Avenue. And we just tried to plan ourselves right at the bottom of that rectangle. So we weren't paying, you know, dead center of midtown uh, rents, but, uh, but we could walk to all our clients or the overwhelming majority of them. So, yeah, the rest yeah. of the company doesn't have an appreciation of how much, you know, how, you know, that third dimension of height in New York city, you know, uh, because these buildings are so high and there's just business upon business and what you said, and I don't you know, 10 square blocks or less, uh, you know, it's concentrated. So everybody takes a subway into your office, but then can actually walk to every one of their clients often in times in the same building. Our office was right between Penn station and grand central. Yep. So yep. I remember I, t I, I was there a couple of times to come visit you. I got right off grand central and it was just a, Oh, I don't know. Driver five iron, something like that. Very close. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a, I, I think it's a, 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 you know, maybe a three for me and a five for you. Right? Uh, uh. And, uh, and so you, you head out of the recession and you're doing well. And then eventually you get out, you sell. Yeah. Yeah. We grew it to about $10 million in revenue in 11 and a half years. And, um, you know, a few different things happen. Um, and there was, there was just a lot of different things making it apparent that the time was right for us to sell. You know, the, the market conditions were there. Private equity had, you know, taken an interest in MSPs fairly recently and particularly in financial services focused MSPs. Um, the, uh, we were definitely at a plateau in the business in terms of, uh, we gotten to the point where I had a partner, we were 50, 50, and it was kind of the, the two headed monster of management, you know, mm -hmm. and we had just figured out we've gotten as far as we can with the two headed monster of management. You know, we really need a, uh, a CEO. And we looked at each other and, and said, I don't know if it's you and I don't know if it's me. And we actually tried to, we, we, we tried our hand at hiring somebody from the outside who, if, if you knew the world of financial services IT well, you'd know the name. He went on to run a very successful, um, well-established company. That didn't work out. And at the same time, my daughter got sick. My daughter had cancer. I wasn't able to work as much. And, um, and we got a terrific offer from a, from a company. And we said, uh, we're going to hate ourselves if we take this offer. The money's really good but we know that they'll totally screw up our company and all our clients. Mm -hmm. So we went to the company that we thought would be the best fit for us and said, Hey, you know, we're not desperate to sell or anything, but if we were, we think you'd be the right fit. We know you recently got some uh, pri private equity backing, you know, let us know if you have any interest there. And, and so kind of the, uh, hmm. you know, when you, when you talk about doing the dance, it wasn't like, it, it was kind of like uh you know, my, fr my friend kind of likes you. I mean, he's happy and all, but you know, if you might kind of like him, you know, he might be interested in kind of taking a skate around the roller rink with you, you know, yes. like that. The, the, so that, uh, that is how things came together. It took about eight months from, uh, from, uh, the start of the process to the end to get the deal done. And there was a lot that went on in between there. That's painstaking. Yeah. I want to talk about your decision to hire a CEO. I always credit the Google, I call them the Google brothers, but they're not brothers, right? Sergey and Brynn, how they came to a certain point, knew they couldn't bring it anymore and hired a CEO. I think that takes incredible maturity. You know, this is your yeah. baby. You started it from nothing and you want to bring somebody in to run your baby. What was that process like? 
Well, we didn't wind up hiring that outside CEO. Um, we tried, mm. you know, the, the, it's incredibly difficult. You know, now I'm, now I have a new company. I have a partner. We have a company called Encore Strategic. We do peer groups and, and business coaching. And my specialty is that we do recruiting as a service. So we're doing fully outsourced recruiting, mostly for MSPs or TSPs or mm. and even some vendors. But, um, but uh, part of what we see out there in MSP world, and I, I would imagine this is not unique to MSP world, it, it really goes across businesses, is that a lot of small businesses, the owner really does all of the high level uh, management and, and technical work, right? And so they build up an organization underneath them where they have level one workers, level two workers, and then they're the level three and the sales and the management, and then the company, you know, gets to a point where um, uh, he's like, I, I can't, it's too big for me to be doing all that, that top level stuff. But at that point, you know, trying to bring people in from the outside to do that stuff is really, mm -hmm. uh, really challenging, really difficult for uh, a business. You know, it, it's an organ transplant at that point. Hmm. You know, and it can succeed or it can fail. And there's a lot of risk involved and it's it's not easy to find a match. So we tried. It didn't work out um, for us. But even in working with other companies, I see it all the time where they go, we're fine at level one. We're fine at level three. All we really need is a, 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 a level two. All we really need is a level three, great level three engineer and a and a service manager. I said, oh, is that all you need? How long have mm. you been looking for? No, nine months, you know, like the, oh, okay, you know. So I've become a proponent of, of you know, instead of building, if you look at your org chart as a pyramid, right? Instead of building from the ground up, build a layer one, build a layer two, build a layer three, build the whole pyramid small hmm. and then and then grow the pyramid, you know that have have high level leadership from the outside in from the in from the uh, beginning, you know, have have tears as quickly as you can get get people reporting to someone that isn't you when you're four or five or six people and not when you're 15. Mm. You know, that, I think that's really important. So very interesting. Uh, would you agree that most MSPs are technology led and most of the what they want to call them CEOs or the leaders are really just presidents and not CEOs that are more visionary, they're more managers and presidents. Yes, for sure. Um, there really is so much uh, variation in, in there. I facilitate five peer groups, right? Two of them are under a million dollars in revenue. Um, one is between a million and two. One is between two million and four, and one is four million up, up past Plus. ten. And and when you look at the things that those groups want to talk about and the way they view their businesses is like apples and oranges. Really? It's night and day. The, the things that the guys in the little, the little companies are talking about, you know, um, uh, technical issues that they had where someone got hit with ransomware. They're talking about evaluating products. They're talking about sales opportunities that they have to make a new deal. And the guys at the higher levels are talking about, um, personnel issues and, and market, uh, market, uh, dynamics and, and how to tweak their sales engine and, and about doing, uh, acquisitions. And, and you know, it's just, hmm. it's like two, it's two different worlds. It really is. Um, you know. hmm. are most MSPs hmm. over tooled? Ha. Um, well, with your permission, I, I'd like to talk about my advice to MSPs. Let, uh, you know, very good. Because it Perhaps leads that's right a segue. into that. Yes. It, it leads right into that. So as MSP owners, right, we're, uh, I like to use the metaphor of a builder. We really need to build three things, right? Uh, the first one, I only put it first because it's obvious. This is the one that everybody knows. You've got to build a client base, right? Um, and that's sales. Like I said, even the guys in those little groups that, you know, aren't thinking big picture, they know that they need clients. Right. And for me, 
I would say you don't just need any clients. If you were to rank clients, clients as A, B, and C, you want all B plus and better clients. And if you can have that in mind from the beginning, all the better. Uh, the other two things that you need to build are not so obvious. You know, second one I would say is a technology platform, right? Something that is a massive differentiator in MSP world is the MSPs that say, we have a platform, and if you hire us, you will use our platform. And the ones that don't have a platform and say, uh, okay, yeah, we can support whatever you have, and, and, uh, and maybe when we have a, a chance, we'll put in one or two other things that we like, and they wind up, you know, all their clients look different. They support a big jumbled mess of, of, of stuff. Uh, their their um, cost of, of support is, is very high because their, their techs need to learn a lot of different products, and it's hard to really develop a mastery over any of them. Um, so when, and when it comes to, I would put that, are they over tooled question into that, into that, uh, second category, I would say some are over tooled and some are under tooled. Hmm. And, and I would, uh, and there's a third category of the ones that are just tool obsessed, you know, where 30% of their time is spent evaluating new stuff, hmm. you know, even, even in a, in a market where things change very quickly you know, identify your needs, uh, make, make your list of non-negotiables for that, for that particular product, go find the best one you can and ride it for 18 months. You know, like you, you, you don't, you don't want to be buying a new car every six months, hmm. you know, the, the, drive it for a while. <laughs> the, the shiny object, shiny, shiny object syndrome is rampant in MSP world. Um, because there's a lot of new products coming all the time, technology right. changes yeah. all the time, and it is uh, a software-driven um, industry. And the third thing that you need to build uh, is a team. And that's the one I think is the most neglected, that if you were to look at the, the two great keys to a healthy MSP, you know, one is, one is technology and one is people. And you go to these trade shows and conferences, and what do you have? You have 150 vendors that are all focused on the technology, right. and no one's talking about the, the people. You know, you can have the best technology, the best tool set, uh, the best technical knowledge in the world, and if you don't know how to build a good team and keep it together, that's going to be your bottleneck. And, and you see these companies that, that have not put any effort into uh, – um, building and cultivating a team and they're still focused on on evaluating all the the latest products and 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 the technology and it's it's uh very much like the legs of a table like we're talking about general business right you have you have sales you have finance you have uh, operations and, and administrative right so the the and if any one of them gets gets out of whack um uh you know it's going to bottleneck your company right the building a team is bottle, a bigger bottleneck to MSPs than than the technology piece. I'm, I'm firmly convinced it's it's the biggest pain point out there. You know, if I go around and interview 100 MSPs, I said, where were, where are your pain points? You know, most of them are not going to tell me, oh, I just need a better security product. It's driving mm, me crazy. That's right. They're going to say, I I can't find good people. You know, and uh, I've become a, a, I'm working on a book. The more I talk about it, the more it forces me to work on it. It's discipline, right? Yes. And, discipline and accountability. Right. Yes. Yeah. Well, I would take some, the, 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 but the first part of that book is kind of making the case for strategic entry level hiring, you know, what I call drafting well. So if you, you go to a sports metaphor, right? Talk about, like baseball is good for me, right? Both Yankee we, fans. Oh, we are. We, the, uh, <laughs> yes, sir. The, um, the best teams learn how to scout and draft and yeah. develop players. You know, I've got a section in there where I've done a lot of research on the core four and how they were signed and where they came from. And, hmm. you know, Derek Jeter was a gigantic prospect. You know, uh, uh, Posada and, and, and Pettit were drafted, both of them, were drafted late rounds should have 
the odds of them ever playing one inning of Major League Baseball were almost nothing. Incredible. And Mariano Rivera was Rivera. signed uh, as an international free agent for three thousand dollars. At the time, he worked. He was twenty years old and worked six days a week on his father's fishing boat. There was no record of it in any newspaper. Um, you know, he, he was literally out of out of nowhere. But the Yankees figured out how to find talent that other people hadn't figured out how to find. They started looking at different things. And so I am a giant advocate of really focusing on entry-level hiring and, and not hiring for skill set, but hiring for potential. Find people that are smart, uh, that are ambitious, that are humble and teachable, and, and work with work well with the fit well with the team that you have, and then build them, mentor them. Uh, the, the highest level people in your company should mostly come from people that you hired a few years ago. Um, going out to the free agent market for every position that you have is a, is a is an exercise in extreme frustration. Mm -hmm. You know the 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 unemployment rate in tech jobs like the ones that companies like the company I had and the company that you had higher for unemployment rates about two and a half right now. It's just oh. enough to count for the people that are out of work for a week or two or crazy. You know, um, the, the, it's virtually impossible to, I mean, some markets are worse than others, but I, I tell people, you know, you wouldn't believe what we're seeing out there. Hmm. Not only can, can some of these companies not find good people, they can't find bad people. You know, right. Some of these for higher level positions, they're having a hard time finding anything, you know, and and sometimes the advent of uh, remote work is helping to ease that situation because uh, open mindedness to hiring someone that's in a uh, uh, an area that's not quite as drained, you know, like in, if you look at the Northwest, there's a lot of tech companies, but the economy has been pretty depressed with. COVID and some of the other things that have happened out there. A lot of people hiring, hiring in the suburbs of, uh, of uh, Portland and places like that. Right. right. So. Now, these problems, Dave, aren't really MSP specific. They're actually quite horizontal as small and medium sized businesses should focus on developing their teams as well. I'm working hard as I write at, at not making the book overly narrow. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, because it really is a, a business issue. And this concept of hiring for potential and not skill set is absolutely universal. Um, I, as my MSP grew, uh, we made the Inc. 5000 seven times. We're in the Inc. 5000 Hall of Fame. We grew very quickly. We grew a $10 million company in 11 and a half years. Uh, but we weren't super profitable. And I was frustrated about that. You know, like I said, we were always flying by the seat of our pants. We were we were always just trying to keep up, shoving money at things. And I I said, you know, there's a few other companies I've come across um, that are growing as quickly as we are that are making a lot more money. Hmm. I want to see if they'll let me pick their brains and 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 I can figure out what they're doing differently than us and doing differently from everyone else. And so I didn't set out to learn anything about hiring and recruiting. I set out to figure out how to make more money. Mm. Um, and as I studied these companies and I went and visited them and, and they were very gracious with me, you know, I, I've done this for years where I just pick people's brains. And after a while, they'd be like, you know, why am I here? You know, I'll be like, I just hoping to get as much I could out of you before you figure it out. I got nothing to give you, you know, like I, I'll buy you dinner. Um, but the uh, it turned out that the common denominator between these fast growth, high profit companies was that they hired and recruited and, and trained differently than everyone else I had seen. They all had internal recruiting teams. They all had very well-defined processes for recruiting. Um, that, and, and it wasn't, they didn't hire, you know, $150,000 recruiters. They let the processes do the work and they used things like aptitude testing and, and uh, online applications before they were cool. And, and uh, you know, I, I've called the process layered filtering, you know, mm. where basically we developed an entire process that, you know, any, any 23 year old can run somebody through that's gonna filter out most of the junk and just leave the, the good, good candidates uh, remaining.
so uh, we, at one point, we spent $152,000 on recruiters in a year. Wow. And I just said, you know, I think I'm going to try what I've seen at these other companies. If I can do as good a job for less than $152,000, we come out way ahead, right? And uh, as it turned out, we spent about half of that, and we brought our average help desk salary down by um, almost 20%. Wow. Um, wow. We cut our time to hire by about 50%, and our one-year satisfaction rate with new hires went up as well. So it was a smashing success. So when I sold the MSP, that's how I wound up going, oh, what do I want to do next? And I said, oh, we, I think we got pretty good at that. So Good for you. And you're in New York City, as we talked about. So it's it's expensive there. I mean, uh, you know, the salaries are high and um, a tough market. So let's we talked about being overtooled and your your second stage is the tech platform. Let's talk about vendors for a moment and yep. what they do right, what they do wrong, what they need to know about MSPs, TSPs, etc. You, you know, I I was thinking about this one and you and I have been around a lot of vendors, right? And a lot. I think for me uh, as we, you know, now we have this new business, we're working out core values. And the one that we've got nailed down that we're pretty sure is going to be in there is win-wins only. And what I mean by that is this, you know, we don't want to ever get in a situation where we don't feel like we can provide you more value than, than, than we're charging you for and still make good money. Um, we want to walk away thrilled with the relationship. We want you to walk away thrilled with the relationship. And frankly, you know, when I look at the vendors out there, I see some that, you know, approach their customer base that way. And I see a whole lot that don't. And knowing a little bit about venture capital and, and having got come through the dot com system, there's a lot of vendors out there that and you can almost read it. Uh, you know, they don't really care about their product. They don't really care about you. They don't really care about their employees. They care about building some market share and, and selling the company and making a whole bunch of money. And, and and I don't even know how much MSP owners really go through that thought process mm. of filtering these vendors, but I feel like they can feel it. They can sense it. And the vendors that I've seen that are really doing uh, terrific work out there that no one has a bad word to say about, there's this whole um, additional component to what they, they have a good product that works well. Um, I can name some names if you like, but, but the other thing they have is like, I used to say, uh, you know, we had a few, a few maxims that we ran our business on that were all very vulgar because we were from New York, but one of them was, you can't teach people to give a shit. Right. Mm -hmm. And as you look at these vendors, you see some of them and you could see that they, they genuinely want their product to work well for their clients. They want their clients to succeed. They go out there and they see it as a, a partnership the people that work there buy into that mentality. And I think those vendors are, are the ones that start to separate themselves from the pack. And like I said, I, I facilitate all these peer groups. You know, there's, there's a handful that no one has a bad word to say about and everyone, and they just carry respect in the industry. And, and they have a good product, but they have more than a good product. You know, they have the people piece too. They care. Yeah, I think you're talking specifically about their their MSP program, their channel program. I mean, we we know cases, we've talked before about how certain vendors try to go after your clients and try to cut you out and uh, you know, these these kinds of situation, but the ones uh, you know, the ones that have really good MSP channels and understand the relationship that the MSPs have with their clients excuse me, are what's important and the MSP is their client is with sometimes they need to be kind of reshaped into what are some great examples of msp channel partnerships that you had uh ones that were that were successful for us yes yeah you don't name well, names if you want but just what did they no, do no, no. you know it's it's uh when i think about it's funny you know you and i know each other from the ConnectWise universe right and they used to invite me to to go speak at their road shows all the time and be on the panels. Did you ever, ever do that for them? Yes, I did it. And I watched you before. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So when, on those road shows, they're basically, you know, prospects and everyone knows that it's nothing but prospects there and they're, 
they're you know getting a nice lunch or a bar tab or whatever in, in return for getting pitched for the day and they would put me on these panels and they'd want me to talk about their product and my favorite part of the product and and tips and tricks for the product and i'd be like listen I, you know it's it's a pretty good product you know but the fact is that the biggest thing you get out of connectwise is is the community right. you and i know each other because of community That's my current right. business partner sean walsh you know, met at a ConnectWise Great guy. user group. The the peer group that I wound up getting into was all guys I met through the ConnectWise user group. The uh, you know a a a high percentage of the relationships that I have in the channel came through that. That, that that's immensely um, immensely uh, valuable. Yeah. The yeah. some of the vendors I see out there now. Um, you know, and I will name names because they're doing a good job and, and, I'm, and I won't name the bad names, but vendors like Solutions Granted and Pax8 and Connect Booster, um, nobody has a bad word to say about them. Uh, they're very uh, plugged in to their, um, and I don't know data well, but I, I might throw data in that, in that, in that uh, arena uh, too. They've worked at their reputations and, um, and uh Everybody likes them, you know, you know, and they pour it back into their, their partners. And that's evident once they pour it back into their partners and they make these communities, they understand how I keep on saying, we, I always still consider myself, you know, uh, you know, in the, in the MSP community, even though like yourself, I, I sold that part. So like, uh, advice for vendors are to kind of follow the models of those companies, any kind of not to do any don'ts. Do you have any bad, I know one particular vendor who we did deal registration with and we got academic pricing and Dave within, you know, a day or two, they were bidding against us. And I know who, you know, who this is. Um, so, uh, you know, rhymes with smell, but anyway, uh, is there, so, uh, yeah, did that ever happen with you? <laughs> Maybe not specifically. <laughs> it but... happened with everybody with smell. Yeah. Um, but yeah. The, the, I will tell you the face of the company and the people at the company who interact directly with the MSPs, you can have mm. the greatest product mm. in the world. And if somebody, you know, gets a reputation for being an a-hole and not really caring about the customers, that's what people are going to talk about. Right. That's what's going to go around. Mm. And the opposite is true as well. You know, if, if they feel like the face of the company or, or the, or the, person that they have to interact with from the company really cares and will go out of their way. It goes a long, long way. All right. There's a, there's a, you know, well, going full circle career wise, I'm actually preaching at my church in the next few weeks. Right. There's nice. a, there's a verse in the Bible that says love covers a multitude of sins. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's a tremendous business application there. I used to say, you know, don't piss people off un unnecessarily. You don't want to use up your credits when you don't need them. Mm. You know, you want to build up credit with people. You want to be personable with them. You want to take a little extra with them. You want to call and make sure that they that they that they're happy. You want to close the loop when you help them out. You want to go over and say hi when you're visiting the office. And if you do all those things and you start to build a relationship and build trust with your clients, then when something goes terribly wrong, they're going to have grace for you. They're going to be patient with you. You know, they're going to they're going to have an, an attitude of we'll get through this, whatever it takes, you know, and and uh, and we like you too much for this to threaten the for this for this to threaten the relationship. Just just make it right and we'll be OK, mm -hmm. you know, versus the when you have the opposite situation, people start to find things wrong where there isn't even anything wrong. It's almost like you there's nothing you can do to make them happy. We've all had those relationships where you just. You want to give up and run away because you just feel like there's nothing I could ever do to make this person happy, right? The the so you want to build those credits, and vendors want to do that with the with their partners too. You know, it, it is when when an MSP feels like this vendor really cares, they helped me when I was in a pinch. They didn't try to try to s screw me when when I when uh, when I needed when I needed something, um, and uh, uh, they're going to get a lot of leeway when it comes to, you know, something going wrong. You know, you, you build up, you build up credit and you want to do that because you're going to need it someday because everybody screws up sooner or later. Yeah. 
Very, very true, Dave. Dave, what motivates you? <laughs> uh, well, I, uh, I again, the full circle thing, I'm, I'm wired as a shepherd. I always looked at my business and just said, the first, first and foremost, I want to help people. And by that, I always looked at my employees first. I want people to be able to buy houses and pay mortgages and start families and and I want to give people a shot at having a good career who might not get a shot from other people. And I want to see them grow and advance in their career and have good, you know, upper middle class jobs and situations. And that, that to me was a lot of motivation for why I did what I did. But I also do have a real serious, you know, athletic competitive streak. And, and I just said, you know, I would say, okay, is everyone, everyone paying their mortgages? Okay. Let's go kick the world's ass. You know, <laughs> that, that, you know, I, we have business consultants in and they'd be like, well, what's your, what's your, what's your goal? I want to freaking win. I want to kill everybody. <laughs> I want to win the monopoly game and flip the game over, you know, do a dance on top of the table. You know, that, 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 that's what motivated me. I, uh, it's interesting that, uh, you know, even with your humbleness, with your spiritual background and, and, and education and, you know, very, uh, you know, very pleasant person to be around, you still kind of have that New York edge. You know, you still have that. I do. <laughs> you do. And, and, you know, you can take them out of the country, but, you know, you can't take the country out of them. You know, I, I absolutely the, love it. The beauty of the beauty of capitalism, and I'm a fan, yeah. is that, you know, you don't have to lose for me to win. Right. We can both win. Good point. You know, the, the, especially in in our industry, there's so much freaking pie. You know, like the it's not like if I eat a pie, a piece of pie, you're gonna starve. All you gotta do is be good at what what, what you do, and, and you're gonna do well. You know, and that's that's true in most businesses. And how do you measure success, Dave Kaba? Oh boy, Ugh. should have given me time to think about that one. I didn't want to. I wanted. To, ah! I purposely did not. I um. I money is, is nice. Right. Yes. But I, you know, I've had a crazy life and it, it's, it's, it's nice having money, but it's not, it's not ult the ult thing that ultimately makes you happy. Life is about relationships, right? The, uh, the, and, and, and you want to be rich in meaningful relationships, you know, with, with friends, with family, with business associates, you know, I would say with God, you know, but that's, that's what makes a person rich and, and, and you reap what you sow. So, you know, I would, I would say pour into people and, uh, and, and you'll never regret it. You know, the, the, I've been through some really hard stuff. You know, my daughter passed away and, uh, you know, we said the, the, the antidote for depression is, 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 is serving others. Um, it's very hard to stay depressed when you're helping other people. Right. And you start to see uh, uh, God do things that you would never normally see when you're helping people that can't give you anything back. So I, um, you know, when you talk about success, you know, money is nice. You know, my partner and I both have have homes in Aruba and, you know, we're going to use that to market. And, and it's, it's nice being able to enjoy the things that the world has, has to offer, but you can have all those things and uh, be miserable. Uh, but if you have the relationships and none of the things you can be happy. So. Well said, well, well said, Dave, Dave Kava, what an absolute pleasure to talk with you today. I, I really enjoyed the time. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed it. So I know whoever's listening and or watching is going to enjoy it again. Dave, how can we get in touch with you? Uh, LinkedIn is a, is a good way. You can email. It's Dave at EncoreSC.com. Uh, but LinkedIn, you can track me down pretty easily. And I'll put it in the show notes. I'll put the LinkedIn address. I'll just put the website for Encore as well. Dave Kava, thank you so much for your time. Enjoy your day. I look forward to seeing you at the next event, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. It was a blast, man. I love what you're doing. Appreciate it. Be well, Dave. Thank you for listening and or viewing Joey Pinn's Discipline Conversations. Please share this episode with one or two of your friends who you think may benefit from the episode. Our website, www.joeypins.com. 
there you find lots of resources and you could join our mailing list please follow us on all our social media instagram twitter and facebook podcast information the video version of our podcast is on youtube please subscribe audio is on all major podcasting platforms please follow them and if you like it please consider giving five star rating would really appreciate that would you like to financially support the podcast you can go to our patreon site consider five ten or twenty dollars a month there's all kind of plans that we have there there's like a one-time payment. What is this podcast episode worth to you? $25, $50, $100, $500, $1,000, $5,000. You be the judge. You can go to our PayPal account to do that as well. Thank you again for listening or watching Joey Pin's Disciplined Conversations.